Welcome to Shattered Reality with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Hello. Hi. Hi, Farusha. Well, another, uh, I guess, another slating to be done. That's the truth. Uh, Today mm -hmm. is July 17th. Mm. 2018. Good. And I'm here with the ever wonderful and marvelous Kate Valentine. And I am also with a ever wonderful and marvelous <laughs> Ferusha. And yes, we do pay each other. <laughs> <laughs> For the compliments. But we've got an even more marvelous and wonderful guest today. That is true. We have somebody who is really world-renowned for his subject. Today, we're going to be featuring on the show George P. Hansen, who wrote the seminal book, The Trickster and the Paranormal. And what I didn't realize until recently mm -hmm. is that he is a nearby individual. He is somebody who lives in South Jersey. Mm -hmm. Now, in discussing the trickster, there's a lot of talk about liminality, being on the edge. And there is something very liminal about New Jersey because <laughs> it's not... New York City, and it's not mm -hmm. Philadelphia, mm -hmm. but it's in striking distance, only a, a rocket ride away, mm -hmm. and it's not Washington, and it's not Boston, mm -hmm. but it's also in striking distance. Mm -hmm. So there is a definite liminality about New Jersey. Now, getting back to our guest, uh, George P. Hansen, um, he, has, um, he has a wonderful history in parapsychology and in skepticism. Um, but he, he was at, um, he was down in Raleigh, North Carolina at the Parapsychological Research Center there. He has worked at the, he's going to tell me the right name, it just slipped my mind, in Princeton. Uh, he Pierre? was also at one Pierre? of the labs, not Pear, mm. but another lab. So let's welcome George P. Hansen and the Trickster. Hi, George. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, to, to make it clear, I was in Durham, North Carolina, okay. at what is now called the Rhine Research Center. It was the Institute for Parapsychology when I was there. Yeah. Uh, and I was there for three years, and then I worked at Psychophysical Research Laboratories in Princeton for five years. Uh, Pear was the brand X laboratory. Uh, I was a rather sharp critic of that work, actually. Is that because of uh, the fact of it being a machine kind of uh, situation with the um, uh, with the random number generators? No, I cr I criticized their statistical and methodology. In fact, I wrote a paper on them uh, with two rather well-known statisticians within the field, and one eventually became president of the American Statistical Association. So it was more of a, a technical critique of uh, methods and uh, analyses. Okay. All right. Um, and, and would you repeat the name of the lab that you worked at uh, in Princeton and the, yeah. its affiliations, please? Okay, it um, it was a privately funded laboratory in Princeton. Uh, it was called the Psychophysical Research Laboratories. It was headed up by a guy named Charles Onerton. Oh, and yes. the funding came primarily from the McDonnell uh, Foundation. James S. McDonnell uh, was head of McDonnell Douglas Aircraft, mm -hmm. and he had a very strong personal interest in uh, the paranormal and related fields. Uh, in fact, the, uh, some of the people who worked for them have are continue uh, to be involved in the UFO topic, okay. as well as parapsychology-related matters. Well, it seems that these fields are very, very related. The field of parapsychology, UFOs, and remote viewing all are very related, and we are going to get into a little bit of that a bit later. But to start off with, um, the second thing I want you to tell us about is a kind of general definition of the trickster. But the first thing I would like to ask you is 
what was the reason that you initially got involved in the in the paranormal or supernatural as you use those terms uh, uh just to sort of uh, widely use them. Well, no, yeah. he, he oh, varies oh. those two terms. Oh, often. he does. Yes, oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Oh, right. yeah, yeah, yes. The dictionary synonyms. It, it's um, Webster's is very clear on that. Uh, a lot of people don't like that, but that's actually the common usage. Anyway, as far as my personal background and interest in, in the paranormal, started in the mid-70s. Uh, this was a time of what was called the psychic explosion. There was a huge amount of interest. Uh, mainstream television uh, was carrying programs. There were movies. A lot of books came out. Uh, and I was living in Kansas City at the time. And there was a free university. You pay a dollar, and you can take a course. Some of the courses lasted only one week. Some courses lasted maybe six or seven weeks. Uh, and there were things on witchcraft and reflexology and tarot and a whole variety of different topics. And one of the courses that was offered was on dowsing. <laughs> well, I thought, well, that sounds interesting. Uh, my dad claimed to be a dowser. In fact, uh, he went out in our backyard and wanted to dig a well, and he took a crowbar and found a spot he thought there'd be water. Well, the neighbors sort of laughed at him, and my mother was not at all convinced. He, she thought this was sort of a tall tale my dad was telling. But anyway, he dug a well and struck water. Huh. So uh, my mother was still a little bit skeptical about the whole story, but... My dad found water, so I was always open to the idea of dowsing because of that. And in fact, uh, at the time, I was also working at an engineering company there. And one of the principals of the company, and I happened to go out on a job site, and he took a pair of welding rods, bent them, and did dowsing himself. Hmm. So uh, anyway, the person who taught the course at the Free University in Kansas City taught it as sort of a psychic skill. And there were a number of psychics there in the class, and he taught meditation as a way to sort of connect psychically. And one thing led to another, and I was hooked. And I've been hooked ever since 1975. This has been a major part of my life, the paranormal and related topics. And, and so you, uh, you kind that's of... the short version. You and kind of now, went back and forth, though, from the skeptic side to the to the I'm going to say believer or experiencer side. Better, better yet, um, and and that that is of great interest to us because although we here at Shattered Reality are all experiencers, we look at things a little skeptically. So you know we don't want to uh, swallow the plastic fish whole, so to speak. Well, yeah, good point. Uh, and I, I was in Kansas City for till 1977, and I was very, very involved. And then I had a job offer out in California, so I went out there and decided, well, I wonder, is this stuff really real, or have I been fooling myself? So I started reading the skeptical literature. And fortunately, I was in Southern California, and there were a lot of university libraries, so I was able to go. I subscribed to what was then called the Skeptical Inquirer, read that, and then they would cite scientific articles and journals, and I would go and read the scientific articles and compare them side by side in the library. And I started realizing the skeptics were making a lot of errors. They were not accurately uh, reporting on what the actual science was. So I got much more interested at that point. And at that point, I started really reading the serious literature and became convinced there's something here. And I always have had an interest in the skeptics because on occasion, they leveled some very, very good critiques. Most of it, rather poor. But there were a few, uh, notably people like Ray Hyman, and uh, Martin Gardner really were pretty sharp. Most of the others, not so sharp, but I kept, and I still pay attention, and I still go back and read some of their works. Yes. So, uh, but I found overall the pro-paranormal uh, position to be far better supported. 
Well, the paranormal has the same problem as almost all of these fields, like even UFO, for example, uh, that you have all this observations but no hard data. And the um, sort of the orthodoxy of science demands hard data, and it's just not possible to get it. Oh, yes, it is. It there is. There is plenty of hard data. In the laboratory, yeah. there's a lot of hard data. Even in, in the UFO field, I think there is more coming out now. It, it, that's a little bit different field, but there are uh, metal samples that are being analyzed. And in the laboratory, there are there have been literally thousands of experiments done under controlled conditions. That's hard data. It, it is, but there's also there's another part, the uh, sort of soft data, and it's, uh, for example, uh, let's say you well, enjoy you say psychological experiments or medical work. Well, uh, medical and um, efficacy and safety of the same types of statistical methods are used. The same types of double blind procedures are used. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is stand, uh, the drug industry is, you know, a, uh, billions of dollars a year industry. It uses the same types of statistics uh, and the same types of double blind procedures. Do you what, think so, uh, what I was actually getting at was, for example, if you enjoy something like the color blue, uh, there's definitely hard data. It's a certain light frequency open and shut. But there's also um, that observational quality to blue. Like, why would you like blue? And uh, I was trying to get it. That's a difficult part to me, like with paranormal. There's a certain sense of it being right and being very hard to prove it right or difficult to prove it right. And um, th that was the point I was getting at. Uh, obviously, if you do get enough statistics, then you, you can start to perhaps, if you quantify it, maybe then you can qualify it. But it, you know what I mean? There's just always that softness to it as opposed to, I don't know, let's say wiring a TV set or something. Okay, but th that's true uh, for uh, pharmaceutical products as well. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But then and you get into that... that it's, uh, what, what the heck? And, what and sometimes bias? they don't even under... No, and sometimes they don't psycho, even understand psycho. how they work. Yes. Uh, you know, there are, I spent some years in uh, pharmaceutical advertising work, and I read probably hundreds and hundreds of what's called prescribing information, looking at mechanisms of action, and often they were speculative, and they would admit they didn't really know how the drugs worked. Uh, so, well, yes, no one, to, to this date, no one even knows how anesthesia works. Everybody knows what it does, but nobody knows what how yes. it does it. But, yes. but that, but that. I mean, I don't mean to raise this point as a skeptical thing. I think it's one of the things that involves a lot of the general public, as opposed to a lot of people don't want to go into IT research. But there is a certain charm to paranormal. Not, not so much that. So that there's like that undefined quality to it, and I think that's what draws people to it. Well, there, there is certainly uh, an amb ambiguous quality to it. There's no question about that. The, these are what are called liminal phenomena, and that's a fairly lengthy uh, discussion in and of itself. But yes, there is a certain uncertainty and instability, and there is a numinous quality to uh, many of these experiences. Right. It invokes something of a divine order or something right. outside of us, something other, something different. Uh, and that's very, that can be very intriguing, but it can also be frightening. Yes, and, and that leads me to what I was going to say about many of the skeptics, particularly the folks that, um, you know, are scientists and um, perhaps have high degrees and have positions of authority at universities and things like that. A lot of these folks, I believe, are skeptics because they don't want to lose control. And once you begin to think of consciousness as being the primary motivator of things and not uh, physics, then you lose control. And these folks don't 
are, are don't not only don't want to lose control, they're terrified of losing control. Do you think that that's a reasonable thought? Uh, in my experience, you know, a lot of people say this. Uh, I've, I've had arguments about this with a number of other people um, on podcasts and elsewhere. I've gone to quite a number of skeptics groups. I used to go to their conventions somewhat regularly and the local meetings. The, the, the skeptical community is in decline now for a variety of reasons, so I don't go as frequently. But no, I really don't think that they are afraid of it uh, psychologically. I think they just think it's uh, silly, a waste of time, and leading to a certain amount of irrationality, which is perhaps a, a more dangerous thing. I, the skeptics I've known, I don't see any like fear. A lot of a number of parapsychologists have explained skepticism as fear of psi. I don't buy that. Okay. The people, uh, I just don't. I, I think that's an uh, explanation they come up with, but they they really have not been able to defend it. I think it's a waste of time to look at it from that standpoint. Okay, we won't do that then. <laughs> I, I think they're more okay. annoyed than fearful. Don't you think they're annoyed by it? Oh, oh definitely annoyed. Uh, why, why would they be so annoyed by it, too? That, that always sort of puzzled me. I, I oh, okay, th- th- that gets to a... <sighs> It, that gets to a much larger issue, and I don't believe psychological explanations are very effective here. I think sociological explanations are. They are part of a the academics typically that are involved with skepticism typically have fairly high status. Okay. These phenomena, and they're in typically bureaucratic institutions. Academia is a very bureaucratic environment. It's just there's different departments, you, and there's different levels of status. There's the graduate students, there's adjunct professors, there's assist, associate professors, assistant professors, full professors. It's a very, very status-conscious uh, environment. These types of phenomena inherently seem to occur where there is a leveling of status, where status con- considerations are no longer appropriate. And this has been shown in earlier societies, and the work on ritual and liminality discuss this at, at great length. So there is something, and there's a guy named Max Weber, who is one of the founders of modern sociology. And he talks about this, and he talks about what he called the rationalization and the disenchantment of the world. Mm. And he went in, into a lot of depth on this, and he talks about charisma, a charismatic authority. And he explicitly discusses in his most famous works that char- pure charisma involves telepathy and things like miracles and weather control. He's fully explicit on that, and virtually no sociologist ever mentioned that. That's because amazing. charismatic authority is antithetical to bureaucratic authority. So that, that is, I am very much into the idea of in re-enchanting the world myself. Um, however, what I think that we need to get from you before we proceed for our listeners, those who have some... Uh, you know, slight idea of what the trickster might be. Other people might be very conversant with it. But could you just give us the short version of the definition? Okay. Uh, it would not be surprising if people are really confused about what that word means, because it means a lot of different things, and it's used in a lot of different contexts. I'll give you a couple de- few definitions. Okay, first of all, the trickster is a character type found worldwide in mythology and folklore. And there are probably over a hundred different uh, characters so identified. Uh, everything from the coyote of some certain North American Indian tribes to Hermes of the Greeks, uh, Mercury of the Romans, Loki of the Norse. Eshu of certain African tribes, it, the, their names from South America, in, in, the, in the Mideast, the Far East, the tricksters are pervasive. 
So first of all, it's a character type. Many, many stories about these characters. Second, it can be considered an archetype. And an archetype is also sort of a confusing idea, but it's basically a collection of characteristics that tend to cluster together. And for my definition of the trickster, there are several characteristics that I tend to emphasize. One is deception, of course. They're tricky. But also, they're a bit of an outsider, and they're sometimes marginal figures. They don't, they're not completely in the power structure. They're not completely outside. They're sort of in this in-between state. They also tend to violate sexual taboos and taboos generally. Um, and they tend to be the shapeshifters. They can appear one way, and in certain North American Indian tribes, it's explicitly recognized. There is no particular character or shape that will di- define the, the trickster. So you've got this ambiguity and uncertainty associated with them. They uh, may have uncertain sexuality, for instance. So it's these this kind of cluster of characteristics. So that makes it a little difficult to conceptualize because ambiguity is built in here with the trickster. That's an inherent property. So it does take a little time and thinking to grasp that and think about the consequences. So we can, I think that's about as much of a definition as I want to give right now. Okay. But uh, I think that might help. That's very clear. I, yes, I that's, think so. uh, that, was, that was very, very clear. Um, and, and you knew Victor Turner, is that correct? Well, I, I never met him. He died long before I got in, interested in his work. Okay, but I wasn't aware of a, what year he died, so excuse yeah, me if I'm early, dating you. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. He, he died in the early 80s, uh, uh, but he was and continues to be a very major influence on my thinking. There are um, several other anthropologists also who have been very, very influential, but he was a, ma- a major one. Well, the inclusion of anthropology in the study of the paranormal is seeming to become more popular today. Of course, um, one of our previous guests, Stanley Krippner, who is like, uh, you know, the man as far as a lot of that is concerned, uh, he popularized that to an extent, and you, yourself included. But today, more and more people um, uh, seem to be talking about uh, anthropology as being the best way to look at uh, the paranormal. I think it's a very good way. I'm not sure if it's the best, but I think it's pretty close. Uh, another person I'd, I'd really like to mention is Jack Hunter. Yes, he's a, a very guy. interesting uh, character over in the UK. Yes, he started invol- getting involved when he was an undergraduate, and he st- as a when we first got into graduate school, he started a journal called Paraanthropology. Mm-hmm. And it, I think, and it's free, it's online, there are a lot of back issues, and a number of people in anthropology and from other fields have contributed to it. Uh, he's more recently, he's finished his doctoral work recently, he's got a number of books out. I have written the foreword for his most recent book. Uh, so, yes, the interest in anthropology and the paranormal has definitely increased, partly due to Stanley Krippner's very early work, but now it's being carried on by a much younger guy named Jack Hunter. Yes, so. we would love to have him as a guest, so um, we'll definitely be speaking to you about Jack Hunter privately, perhaps of getting Great. him as a guest, because I'm very, very, very uh, won over by his method of research. I find it very, very interesting. Um, I thought that maybe I could speak to you about my idea about my feeling about the trickster, and you could you, you could discuss it with me, and maybe people, because I would be giving somewhat concrete examples, and you could 
not, you could correct me, you could say correct me or discuss it with me or argue with me. I'm not a very big on arguing per se. I usually don't argue, but let's, can we try something like that? Yes, please do. Okay. Um, you have the idea of uh, destructuring as uh, a, um, a window that opens for, uh, for the paranormal to come in. When times are changing and things are destructuring and there is fluidity and ambigu- ambiguity, uh, and that allows for paradigm shifts in our way of looking at things. And I wonder if that could be because we are basically... Uh, consciousness living in a physical body and when people's consciousness begins to change about a subject and there is the beginnings of a paradigm shift it can seem because reality is changing it can seem like the paranormal uh yes and uh, um there's a number of examples of this uh, one that i use is the fall of the berlin wall and the collapse of communism uh when that happened in 89, early 90s, there was a major upsurge of interest in the paranormal all across the Eastern Bloc. Uh, if you look back in the 1970s, well, what did we have? Well, we had Watergate. We also had, before that, the sexual revolution, the drug culture, all of that, uh, the women's movement, all of that, and civil <laughs> rights movement, all of that preceded and was con- uh, somewhat it happened about the same time as the rise of the interest in the paranormal. So, yes, these shifts are very important, and typically you will find an increase in interest and involvement and reports. Well, the more important thing is, do the shifts cause this, or does uh, that type of paranormal activity cause the shifts? Oh, that's a great question, and I would say that uh, you can't determine that fully. Yeah, yeah. They go, they go together. The mm. the idea of cause and effect is something that the trickster tends to blur. Which comes first? Mm. Which causes the other? Well, it may they work together, mm. and if you start getting this constellation of characteristics in in one way, it may reflect in other parts of society or other parts of the mm. universe. And so things, the cause effect, like what it sort of harks back to what Carl Jung talked about is synchronicity, an a causal mm. connecting principle. Yeah. And the trickster is often associated with synchronicity. So I think, yes, it's one can try to claim a cause effect relationship, but if you step back, it's not quite so clear. But it's a really good question. So, so you think of the trickster as sort of an agent of change then? Oh, definitely. Ah. And tricksters arise ah. in ages of change. I think Donald Trump it clearly has uh, trickster qualities. Uh, another person even more strikingly trickster, is not prominent as much now, is uh, Milo Yiannopoulos. Uh, he was so trickster-like, I think he sort of self-destructed. <laughs> yeah, but trickster yes. himself. <laughs> Um, oh yes, and that—that's a com- it, when someone becomes too tricksterish, they very se- well can self-destruct. Seriously, it, 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 sure, it, it is a risk. Yeah, ah. I could see that. I—I um, um, I wanted to go back to the idea of you speak of the trickster as a single entity. Is that with? Uh, do you do that with a reason, or do you think it's a single entity, or a single a zeitgeist? Almost, that's not quite the right word, but I think you know where I'm going. That it's a- oh, no, no, it's a, it's a it's a it's a very important question. And again, uh, the way we think in our culture, you, you start. To, I use the term and. You, and historically, in, in myth, there is a name given to it, so people think it is an entity. Mm. No, it's more, it's more abstract than that. It's a collection of these characteristics. And there's almost no way we have in our culture to convey that idea succinctly. Mm. But it's more like a zeitgeist or a ghost or you know, a, a spirit somehow that's out there. You can see it manifest in a variety of ways in different people. And I talk about the trickster manifesting in individuals 
and in small groups, and even in entire cultures. Uh, sometimes in larger organizations when they start to become unstable, and even in nations, uh, the trickster archetype can start to manifest. There can be blurring of boundaries. The old uh, rules no longer are enforced or apply. And in those types of situations, in those transition states, you have a trickster constellation. Mm-hmm. So, so yes, it's, your question is very, very good and very, very important for understanding the nat- nature of the trickster. We talk about it as a single I- individual, but in, in more and it be, be clear to understand it in a more ambiguous and a multifaceted aspect, multifaceted way. About a year ago, we had a woman who I'm sure you know of and you probably know. Uh, this woman is quite intelligent and very well regarded. Her name is Leslie Kane. Do you know her? Uh-huh. She, okay. So I've she, never met her, but I know of her and I've read some of her work. Oh, I've, I've, I've met her. I wouldn't say I know her like personally too much. I've met her, and we interviewed her here on Shattered Reality Podcast on her book about uh, the after-death experience, um, and uh, it was a fascinating book, and she did some wonderful research, but she boiled it down to a binary conclusion that it was either super psi or it was, you know, your dead relatives or her, her dead relatives or whoever's dead relatives. And I kind of like said to her, um, what about if it is neither? What about if sometimes it's one thing, sometimes it's another, and then sometimes it's a tricksterish sort of thing, like a discarnate entity. And for me, many of the times that I am confronted with the trickster, uh, it seems like it's a dis- discarnate entity perhaps something that was never human, but does have some form of a a personality and does enjoy in some way tricking the human. And I'm going to go forward with this for a second before I ask you to speak to it. And and sometimes um, it just seems as this is one of the reasons why I don't go out and do mediumship because I've seen too many instances where people were given false information and it would seem as though humans believe that they're the crown of creation when in fact there could be lots of other things between the human being and uh, the ultimate godhead. I, I resist using the word God because it has so many other implications, the universal consciousness, whatever you want to call it, the supreme one. Okay. So could you speak to that a little bit? Well, I am in complete agreement with what you said. Uh, There, to identify a particular source of, of psychic information or conceptualize it in a binary fashion. No, I think that's flat out wrong. Uh, there are probably multiple uh, sources for these types of phenomena. Even in the laboratory, where we try to control this as best we can, we realize we cannot fully define where the source of ESP or PK comes from. It could come from the future. Uh, there are many exper- laboratory-based experiments that suggest people in the future uh, may influence past events. Oh, yes. That's one, hard to wrap one's head around, but there are laboratory experiments, some very tightly controlled, that do suggest that. So I am much more in a, a alignment with what you say than what uh, Leslie Kane would say. Well, I, I just uh, to to defend Leslie just for one minute. I think she did some very interesting and marvelous research. It's just her binary conclusion that I would argue with. So yeah, she she certainly had a lot more background in the UFO topic. Uh, she jumped into the life after death issue with a lot less background. I don't think uh, that book is as valuable or, or as her work on the uh, UFO topic. Um, Well, I am interested in a recent resurgence in 
um, the work of one of the people that I believe was one of your mentors, which is W. E. Cox and the uh, and the mini lab um, stuff, which. Um, I got into the actual study of these things as a study a little bit late because I was working, bringing up a child and, um, and working very hard at events and having clients and dancing and doing a lot of things. And so I kind of missed out on doing some of the research or reading that I should have done at an earlier day. But now I'm, I'm seeing that some of the older research that seemed to have been disappearing, there is a resurgence in interest in. And one of the things is the mini lab. And you wrote a paper, which I read online, about um, Cox and the mini lab. And do you want to speak to that at all? Sure. Well, first of all, Cox was never a mentor to me. Okay. Uh, uh, he was a colleague. Uh, he was a very odd character, quite liminal. Uh, prob- in fact, but I did dedicate my book to him. You know, I have a lot of respect for what he did, uh, but uh, Ed Cox had some serious limitations, should we say. He, ha- he was very good in some areas and very limited in others. Uh, but I, I still have respect for him uh, because he devoted his life uh, to study this, uh, the phenomena in ways very few people have, have ever done. So uh, the mini-lab has gotten renewed interest. Uh, in fact, there is a rel- rather new book out by James McLennan, who's a sociologist who spent uh, decades following the Surratt Group. The title of the book is The Entity Letters, and it's published by Anomalous Books. Uh, and it's if you want details on that work, it's a very, very intriguing case. I spent a fair amount of time, I did formal experiments with them, and I, with the Surratt Group, and my conclusions was that fraud was clearly attempted. I spent five nights in the home, I observed a number of phenomena I don't have a good explanation for. However, they were not the events in the home of the, the Surratt people were not under fully controlled conditions. But I can't prove that they were fraud, and I can't prove that they were absolutely genuine. Uh, just to cut in quickly, what, what are you referring to as a mini-lab? Okay. Good question. <laughs> Excuse me. A mini lab. Excuse me. Uh, a mini lab is basically an inverted fish tank hmm. that is. I hope you can edit this because. Yeah. <laughs> you want to get water Whoa. or something? I, I've got some water right okay. with me. Uh, I have had a bit of a cough uh, for <laughs> a while. This is really kicking in. Uh, uh, This is basically a study in what's called macro PK, physical movement of objects. And what Ed Cox did was put objects (laughs) in an inverted fish tank, put a a set of camera on them, (laughs) on the tank, to monitor what happened in the mini lab. And he had (coughs) obtained a number of film strips of things moving, very, very bizarre events. Hmm. It looked ridiculous. It looked fraudulent. It looked really silly. But the circumstances around it are very, very peculiar. <laughs> it, the the group was started by a guy named John Nyhart, who wrote the book Black Elk Speaks. He was a professor at the University of Missouri, and he gathered around him a group of students in the early 1960s, and they conducted seances, and they communicated. Is there's there's music on the line? Yeah. 
<laughs> That's Farusha. It's the trickster. Oh, <laughs> okay. God. Okay. See, see, your 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 cough is troubling you. The, the phones are going off. It's that trickster. <laughs> I'm telling you. <coughs> But that, that's interesting. So I didn't realize it, it uh, involved psychokinesis because I did oh, have, it, I, it, I, I had a friend yeah. who could absolutely, I mean, she did it on many, many occasions, not to, uh, for anything. I mean, we were just a bunch of people talking and she go, yeah, watch this, boom, off it go. So uh, it was just an ability that she had. So, I mean, there was, uh, I was totally convinced. I don't know. I don't think there were magnets under the table. I mean, <laughs> Okay. So uh, that's interesting. So he put these objects under a fish tank and then filmed it? Yes. Uh, in the basement of the uh, the home uh, with the medium. Uh-huh. Uh, so the, the Cox's controls, and one of the things I, I critiqued uh, his controls, which were really rather poor. Uh-huh. But there was an, an, an amazing amount of the phenomena, and this went on not just for years but for decades. Wow. And McLennan's book goes into it in great detail. Uh, it's a very liminal group, but they were they would conduct seances. Uh, uh, some of the people would go into trance. There were full table levitations and a variety of other phenomena, of uh, uh, appearances of spirit forms and the like. It's a fascinating case, and. If anyone wants, to, and it remains ambiguous and controversial to this day, uh, but it is a book that has come out within the last few months, and if anyone wanting to get some idea of the problems involved in this research, this might be a good place to start. I don't know of any book like this, because McLennan has been involved with this over decades, and he's a sociologist and writes from that perspective, but also a participant. And the narrative that he provides in the book is quite interesting. Fascinating, actually. Very did, fascinating. Did uh, he come to any conclusion in the book? Uh, well, you have to read the book. Okay. I, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm featured in the book. Uh, he and I do have uh, arguments about, you know, what all this means. Uh-huh. So I will let Jim's writing okay. speak for itself. Okay. Uh, I'm convinced that what I saw in part was fraud. There were other parts. I don't know. Hmm. There's uh, apparently a German group, uh, a newer group, that has uh, begun this sort of um, activity. Um, and I, yes, I'm, there, there, there are a number of groups, uh, but the Felix group. The uh, Felix uh, group, uh, that's it. Uh, around uh, Kai Mugi. Very interesting case. Uh, he has been caught in trickery. Uh, it's... I think it's more complicated than that. I can't speak on it in great depth, but there there have been a, there's uh, been a few reports in the Journal of Scientific Exploration, and a researcher named Michael Nam has provided some very sharp criticisms. Yes, uh, and I find his criticisms compelling. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the sociology around it, and I've known people who've been in the in the, in the circle. Uh, the Felix Circle, and I'm very skeptical of it. On the other hand, Kai Mugi himself is a very intriguing character. So I think it's worth studying, but I don't think that we have strong evidence for psychokinesis there. One of the main researchers, one of the people who've been as prominent as a researcher is a guy named Stephen Brody, who is oh, sure. a philosophy professor, but has absolutely, his last I talked to him, he has absolutely no background in magic. You want anyone who professionally investigates macro PK must have a background in magic. Yes. Roddy seems to have absolutely none. That rules him out as a competent professional. I'm sorry. Well, he's uh, been our guest here, and what I think that he is um, very good at is um, sort of the idea of intention and, um, you know, the the thoughts about negative intention as well as positive intention and how that might work. That's where I think he excels. He's a very interesting man to listen to, but you are correct. He's not a professional magician. He doesn't know all the magician's tricks. 
And right, right. Yeah, what, as a philosophy, it's very interesting. You know, I like reading some of his philosophical works. Why do you and say it's, he's important that way? Why do you say it's so important to have a background in magic? Because there are, for most, for macro PK, that's the uh-huh. physical object. There's two basic alternatives. It's either real mm-hmm. or it's fake. You ah. have to know. Uh, how to fake this and the methods used. Mm. Even magicians will miss methods. You know, I have, I used to be moderately active in, in the magic world. Mm-hmm. I would go to the conventions, and I remember seeing, I'd go to, remember one, going to a convention and being shown how a trick is done. Two months later, I went to a lecture. The same method was was used, and I had no idea that's how it was done. Huh. Uh it takes, and it takes a lot of experience to start recognizing those. So you want several magicians involved. If it involves simple observation, if you have controls over the situation, you still need magicians to assess. Okay, how do you get around the controls? Because there have been a number of parapsychological experiments where. The researchers thought they were in control, but if you read the report and understand what was going on, no, the act, the, the subject, the PK agent actually had control of the situation, and the researchers had no idea that was happening. What do you think of uh, Ingo Schwann in that case? Well, Ingo was mostly did did very little or no macro PK work. Uh, it was the, the PK he did on thermistors was statistically analyzed. I was friend, Ingo and I were were friendly. I would go up and talk with him, and I, in fact, I even did a ghost investigation of his building. Huh. So I like Ingo. Uh, Ingo was a very very odd character. I, I never saw him engage in fraud, but I never saw or saw him try to do macro PK. That's where the, the most highly like high likelihood of fraud in parapsychological research is like is bound to occur. A lot of uh, the skeptics out there um, famously criticize Ingo uh, because of his metal bending prowess, which of course as is... Far as, I know, as far as I know, Ingo never bent metal. I've never seen any report that Ingo did that. On television, he did. Uh, I, I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I, Yuri Geller, yes. Ingo, I have never seen I'm any sorry. of that. I'm sorry. I was talking about... Uh, I'm sorry. I conflated the two people. I'm awfully Oh, they're very sorry. different. Yes, I know no, they're no. very different. No. Ingo, no, I, Ingo has passed, Ingo and kind of, Yuri is still yeah. with us. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> Yuri starters. has admitted... Yuri has admitted in his one of his biographies that he used tricks. Hmm. There's no... No, he, he came out and said that, that he had... And Ingo was always kind of pleased to have Yuri out in front and center and taking all the flack. So Ingo would just, you know, wouldn't <laughs> have to deal with the critics near so much. Oh, so yes, I'm, I'm really, I apologize move. to the memory of Ingo Swan for oh, complaining sure. no, him. I think he's it, probably laughing about it. <laughs> okay, all right, because they were very different people. But they oh, yeah. they worked in and around the same time frame, and they both worked yeah. out out at uh, Stanford Research with... Um, right, right. Harold Putoff yep, right. and um, our... And Russell Targ. Our friend Russell Targ. So which brings us to some things that you had said you are working on to some extent now, which involves... Um, UFOs and remote viewing and so forth. So did, did you want to share some of that with us? Well, I can talk a little bit about that. Yes, I've had a long-term interest in the UFO phenomena. I started attending meetings of the New York 14 Society in the mid-1980s, and that was run by John Keel. And John Keel and I eventually became friends, and we talk on the phone fairly often. And John Keel was one is one of the one of the most important uh, investigators of the UFO topic. And reading his books, there were lots of mythological types of creatures uh, yeah. that he reported on very odd events. 
And he and Jacques Vallée really provided some alternative ideas to the whole idea of ETs or extraterrestrials. And so I have kind of extended that work with theoretical ideas from the concept of liminality. And that's too much to go into here. Okay. Uh, but it is what you will see in remote viewing. The, the, the connection between remote viewing and UFOs is really, really strong. And I point out, uh, and even with Yuri Geller, Yuri Geller had UFO experience as a young child. And when Yuri Geller was brought to Stanford Research Institute for testing, Jacques Vallée at times was stationed on the roof of the building to watch for UFOs. So the government researchers 45 years ago understood that there was some fundamental connection between the two. And only now are people starting to wake up to this. Uh, but the government researchers understood there was a deep connection, and I'm absolutely convinced that they were on the right track with that. Well, I now, think that Jeffrey Mishlove, some years ago in writing his book about the PK man, certainly saw a connection there. Yes, he did. Yes, and uh, Jeffrey was out working in the field, you know, with Ted Owens, uh, and understood that these could, people who get out in the field and get to know psychics will start to realize this fairly quickly. A lot of people who work only in the labs have relatively limited contact with psychics. And a lot of parapsychologists even tend to shy away from uh, getting to know psychics socially. I was quite the opposite. I was involved with psychic groups and and mediums and, and contactees, abductees, and the like before I got involved with laboratory-based research. So I had the scientific types, especially people who go into psychology and get doctoral degrees, well, they don't interact with ordinary people quite as effectively sometimes as they probably should. But Mishlev was different. You know, he got out and really got to know a lot of different people. But if you look at the research, you look at MUFON, for instance, they had a, and may still have a explicit policy for their state directors not to talk about psychic aspects of UFOs. Hmm. And if you go to parapsychology conventions, you will almost never see a top a, 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 a UFOs in a parapsychology convention. Well, that's a shame, both ways. Yeah, yes. And even in the Society for Scientific Exploration, some there they may have both topics, but there is very little overlap in, in exploring why that connection is there. Well, that would be the that would be the interesting part. Uh, I mean, like, what would be the basic underneath of both uh, both of these studies? Okay, that that requires uh, an, an uh, a structural analysis mm -hmm. that comes out of anthropology, and that <clears throat> and I I can't really effectively convey that verbally over, you know, a phone line. Right. When I present that work, I always use PowerPoint, and the diagrams I use typically uh, are conveyed fairly effectively to people who are familiar with the field. Mm -hmm. But it has to do with the fact that there's this betwixt and between, this liminal area. And I, I just hesitate to go there. I can show the connection between ghosts and UFOs a little more easily because ghosts are between life and death. They kind of challenge that that notion that the dead and uh, dead and alive are completely different. Well, the ghost ghost is sort of in between. Okay. Much the same with UFOs. UFOs fly between the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. They're in this in-between state. They're not of the heavens necessarily fully, but they, they seem to have some terrestrial properties. They're metal or something. There's some, there's some material mm -hmm. or physical aspect to them. But they're ambiguous. Now, in most science, <clears throat> this is just anathema. You just can't, 
can't deal with it that way. But in anthropology, there is theoretical work that addresses these types of concepts mm. and address it, can, be, can use em, empirical methods to address these types of concepts. It's not the usual scientific way of thinking. This is becoming more understood within what's called post-structuralism and post-modernism, but even there, there's a real leeriness of uh, dabbling in the approaching these areas. However, there are a few people in, in, from, a, from post-structuralist, post-modernist, and feminist and women's studies perspectives that are offering some really, really intriguing uh, ideas. Well, that sounds very interesting to me. Um, and I wonder, the obvious question now, uh, which uh, I feel almost obligated to ask you given current events, is um, what do you think about uh, the folks with the To the Stars Academy? Particularly, uh, I, I have more interest in Eric Davis and Hal Putoff than um, the, the nice young man from Blink-182. Okay, um... I follow this moderately well, but I have friends and colleagues uh, I, I speak with. I was out at a conference in California, contacted in the desert a few weeks ago, talked to Richard Dolan, uh, Linda Moulton Howe, uh, and, <clears throat> and several others. The, uh, the, the general consensus is that what we have is not disclosure, but something like confirmation. Okay. Uh, Grant Cameron is another person. Oh, yes, Grant okay, Cameron. Okay, the government, yes, is, sure. government is admitting something, but they're dribbling it out yes. slowly. Uh, I don't fully, there's no way we can fully trust what they're telling us. No, there could be disinformation. Uh, we don't know. It could be. Uh, they are very coy about what they release, and this is almost certainly intentional. Perhaps they think this is too revolutionary, uh, that, and I suspect maybe they're right. These phenomena have a scary aspect. These phenomena are not all benign. They themselves may not really understand, they may not understand the nature of what they're dealing with. So they're going very slowly. It's fascinating, so, however. It's a fascinating uh, uh, turn yes. of events, shall we say. It, it is, but it's also very confusing, very ambiguous, very trickster. Yes. Uh, so I watch this, and I, I think Tom DeLong yes. has been selected. Uh, he was selected by the intelligence agencies and built up. Grant Cameron goes into this in great detail as how this occurred, and this has happened before. We have seen other efforts like this in the past, but this seems m more extensive than we've seen in the past. So I'm, I take it very, very seriously. Well, the, I have two things to to add to the, the discussion, and you can speak to these ideas if you care to. Um, one thing is... Um, I'm fascinated to start off with with the whole thing. I'm fascinated with all the personalities involved. But I would say just off the top of my head, it's doubtful to me that anybody's walking out of the Defense Intelligence Agency with a couple of uh, videotapes under their arm and nobody's saying anything. Uh, that just that belies my feelings of reality about the situation. So it's my contention that it's intentional that the yes. stuff is being released. And, and, and Luis Elizondo, as nice a gentleman as he is, and very intelligent and bright-eyed, um, it just seems to me illogical to think that he just stuffed these things under his arm and uh, took his walking papers. Uh, that that oh. does not seem to make any sense. Oh, 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 oh for sure. The, absolutely. And if you go back and you look at the Podesta emails that were released by WikiLeaks, well, uh, Leslie Kane's name is in those emails almost three years before this, ex this disclosure. So the, and other reporters or other writers for the New York Times were mentioned years ago. So this has been planned for quite some time. 
Leslie Kane basically is just reporting what the intelligence agencies want. There is no investigative reporting done by the New York Times. They are just the mouthpiece. Uh, this is what we should expect. This is how it's being played. Uh, the other uh, observation that um, I'd like to make about it is that um, uh, how many uh, billions of people on the face of the earth, they say somewhere above 7 billion, some people say somewhere above 8 billion, but it really doesn't matter the exact number. Um, and the, the reports have come out that people aren't going to be shocked by there being um, aliens and stuff. They're not it's not really going to shock most people, but if it only shocks and disturbs, I mean really mentally disturbs, one in a hundred or one in a thousand, that's still a whole lot of folks. Well, uh, maybe, but maybe maybe these phenomena will be shocking. Maybe they will be destabilizing. The fact that they're given attention may affect the nature of the phenomena. Aha. Uh -huh. So, uh, you, you know I what, Mark? No, honestly, what I think is going to happen is let's say it's disclosed that these are indeed aliens and they're here and, uh, they just came because they felt it was part of their nature to explore. They explored. They said, yeah, it's interesting, but not that great. We're leaving. I think most people would just continue on with their life. I mean, and say, wow, it's really fascinating. How about that? There is other life out there. That's great. And then go on, pay taxes, go to their job. I honestly don't think it's going but to it be does, that big a deal. It doesn't really have don't. to be. Uh -huh. Most people can do that. Like, let's say that your no, I know what idea, you're saying that there's but it 10 only has to be one in a thousand who yeah. like completely flips their lid, and that's a whole lot of characters. Well, they, they're flipping their lids every day over nothing, anyways. So. <laughs> well, that's it. Well, 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 what, what, what if these uh, beings have extraordinary powers? Well, what if they have powers or like uh, well, demons or well, elves or then, fairies? Well, then that's the end of religions. And then, then that's another whole big topic to get into because, you know, well, only the religious deity of whichever particular religion it is has those powers. And if somebody or something else has them, well, uh -oh, that's not good. Well, well, no, a lot of religions are polytheistic in some sense or other. Mm -hmm. And there may be multiple uh uh, entities. Well, don't forget uh, the Vatican has the most accomplished astro uh, biology, bio, astrobiology lab. Uh, yeah, facility ever anywhere. Well, <laughs> mm -hmm. they're I, planning. <laughs> I know, go back to the thinking ho ahead. The whole idea. I don't know if they're they're visitors from space or interdimensional or tricksters or discarnate <laughs> beings, and it might be all of those things. Come on, there's going to be mission bells on Mars one day. But uh, <laughs> but what you know, I, I would just say that it's it still comes down to man's ego, human ego, that we think we're the next thing right next to God, and there could be a lot of stuff in between. Uh, I, by God again, I don't want to get into the religious thing. Well, so you, you anybody know, you had there. that whole thing with Copernicus and Galileo and all. But the people most upset were the people in power. Your average peasant and serf could care less. They go, oh, we go around the sun? Oh, oh, we always thought the sun went around us. Oh, well, okay. I, I mean, that was, to me, 99% of the population, the 1% whose power depended on the sun going around us, they were upset. Okay. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't disagree with you. I would just say that we're coming from different parts of uh, different ideas but that's why we're here together on shattered reality we are uh we sometimes argue with ourselves instead of with our guest <laughs> not argue but have slight disagreements so what say you george about what disclosure let's say uh, one day they land on all right let's take them off the white house lawn for now and let's say they landed on uh, the University of Kansas, out in Manhattan, Kansas. And, um, um, Columbia that's University. a hypothetical. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's the heartland. It's the middle of mm -hmm. the country. And they decided, oh, okay, there's good press coverage there. So we'll land there, Manhattan, Kansas. Nice big open fields. <laughs> well, they might. Uh, we, we've never seen anything like that before, so I don't think we should expect it now. 
right. uh, these these phenomena. But that's what the trickster be, does. He he comes around. And he says, "Oh, you weren't expecting this, were you?" <laughs> I, th- but, uh, I think it I depends think on the level of observation. I know, but I uh, really think your idea of the trickster, the whole uh, the whole thought behind it, is really just fa- fascinating. And it just, to me, it's as you said, it's not really an entity. It just reflects on such an intriguing part of human personality that I, th- I think we all play tricksters on each other from time to time, don't you? Yes, everyone has some aspects of, of don't you? Yeah. within them. Yeah. Yeah. When we look uh, at the paranormal, it, the paranormal looks back at us, right, George? Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and it interacts with us, yeah. and it responds. That's the reflexivity part of it that you discuss, correct? Wow. Yes, yes. I like that thought, too. That So it's not just a trickster being out there somewhere doing tricks, but, uh, but that it, 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 it actually requires us to interact with it. Yes, that's wow. it, it's nature. Yes. Wow, interesting. Yeah, I don't know how you came up with all these thoughts. I really, it had. I, I was always surprised when I l- heard you speak about it because it was something that was so out of my experience or thought. I, you know, I just never thought about. It. I'm not to say it was good, bad, or different. It just hadn't occurred to me. And uh, I used to think, wow, trickster. Wow. Well, yeah. Well, as a practitioner in, uh-huh. in the psychic field. Um, I didn't know it was called a trickster until, you know, say five years ago or seven years ago. But I was very aware that the information that was being received might not be true in, uh, like from UFO, uh, like like the, oh, the contactees. Something happened to most of those people. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some of them were frauds, but something happened to most of those people. And whatever happened to them, the entities that caused the contactees to come into being, sometimes they were told lies. Or sometimes maybe they were told stuff that they couldn't quite comprehend, and and their monkey brain added another layer to it, so it made it seem like lies. What do you think, George? Oh, yes. Uh, John Keel, I think, would fully agree with you. And he had plenty of experience with contactees. Uh, yeah, this is the nature of the phenomena, you know, often. And it can be very disruptive and destabilizing. Yeah. Uh, and I understand why people will not want to channel ETs. Mm-hmm. Some will, but yes, there are risks there. Yeah. Yes, you bet yeah. your life there are risks to it. I yeah, it, it, you know, it, and I think that comes back to another part of why a lot of it is not being investigated. There's something very frightening about it, too, Be- because with almost invariably with the uh, contactees, the contact occurs late at night, you're alone, and these freaky little things show up. I mean, I don't care if they're from Pleiades or if they're from a bad guy down the block. Anything that wakes you up in the middle of the night when you're alone, I think, is very frightening, very alarming. And well, well, yes, and if and if you look at earlier cultures, the people who dealt with these kinds of entities mm-hmm. and who were in charge were the shamans. They uh-huh. went through a lot of ritual purification. They were set aside from the rest of the tribe, mm-hmm. and approaching this realm was always looked upon as somewhat dangerous. Yeah, there were rituals of protection. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I think that tells us something about the nature of these phenomena. Yes, there is a frightening and scary aspect. We shouldn't be shying away from that. Well, it's because we don't understand it. I mean, thunder used to be very frightening. Meteorites used to be fr- or meteors used to be frightening. But now that you understand it, it's not quite as scary. February okay, fireballs but, but, are. But thunder and lightning don't have their own intelligence. These phenomena may have their its own intelligence. Right. Right. That puts it in a different category. Right. 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 It, yeah. No. Definite. Yeah. I see what you mean, yeah. Like, yeah. Mm. So, George, what's up next for you? Well, I've got lots of theoretical work I'm doing. I I spent a lot of my time reading, going to libraries and online. Uh, So I've I've got... The next lecture I'm giving will be in Lilydale in a little over a week. I'll be talking about transgender and the paranormal. 
Mm. And there's a lot I could say about that. That might be another time. Uh, but transgender is very related to the paranormal. And people who have been trans or gay have had a long, long association with psychic abilities. Mm. This goes back thousands of years and in all, uh, pretty much worldwide. So that's what I've been uh, will be speaking on and topics somewhat related to that as well as a variety of philosophical issues uh, that emerge from what's called postmodernism and poststructuralism. So I, I imagine we could get all these dates on your website. No, I. Je- no. I. Uh, no. Um, if you look at Lily, Lily. No, I, I generally don't publicize much of what I do. I, okay. I, you know, I. Uh, I'm, I'm not. I. I do podcasts when people ask me. I, I'm not really a self promoter. I don't, you know, people ask me to speak, I'll be happy to do that, but mm-hmm. I don't go out looking for it. And I, I have a website, and I've also got a few papers on academia.edu. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, we, uh, we, so you're we, doing this for the love of the game, then? Well, yeah, I think it's important. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just something I can work on and make a contribution uh, with. You, well, you know, it's a long time ago I applied for a job in genetics, and the woman that was talking to me, I was very interested in it, and she said, well, you know, before you apply any further, my F2 generation is trees. And I said, trees? I go, but that's a lifetime. And she said, well, someone has to start. And, uh-huh. <laughs> and I think in your case, definitely, uh, and, and certainly all the other researches that you've mentioned, but it, it is, it's a very important topic and it's scary to people because it's not understood. And when it is understood, it loses the scariness. And we have a little bit more control over things that typically are not thought to be controllable. So I think you're doing a great job. I really do. Well, we, thank you. We have been really pleased to have you on board here today. And I'm hoping that you will agree to come back to speak with us and uh, maybe even uh, be on a video podcast with us should we decide to do something like that since you're reasonably nearby. Well, that sounds good. Yeah. Well, so thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, George, thank of course. So thank much, you so much George. for us. Thank you. We really appreciate your being on and um, we shall be in touch. Okay. So- Okay, so thanks saying again. Goodbye George. to you. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Take, and we, take care. Right. I was lost in thought here. I'm sorry. You brought up a lot of topics, and Ferucci caught me by. I'm, I'm sitting here going, like, what? Huh? <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, George. Appreciate it. You, yeah, well, we've you been betcha. on for an hour and 15 minutes. Oh, so we've, oh, we have to oh. make a few announcements. Oh, okay. And um, say that if people would please agree. Uh, to like us on Facebook, like us on our websites, and like us on YouTube. Uh, I also have uh, put up a, um, a photo, a little photo blog on, um, on Instagram called Shattered Reality Podcast, and I'm going to be more active with that coming up, so you can find us there and like us. Uh, but please like us on shatteredrealitypodcast.com and shatteredrealitypodcast.wordpress.com. And if you have had a UFO experience or if you have had an out-of-body experience or... Or if you just find something unusual in your everyday life and you're like, what was that? Then let us know. Maybe we could help you with it. Yeah, we can. We can have you on. We can mm-hmm. talk to you about yeah. it. And if you don't care to be on, but you would like to be mentioned on the podcast, mm-hmm. please do um, have a written, a short written report on it. This past week, I received a very interesting written report on Ferusha dot wordpress dot com, which is my blog. And uh, some years ago, I wrote uh, an article about huge black butterflies I saw on my trip down to uh, 
the Monroe Institute. And now, after a number of years, a, a person wrote to me about a large black butterfly that she saw that isn't mentioned in any of the field guides on um, on the internet or whatever. And when I saw my black butterflies, they were not mentioned either. And then last night, I saw a huge black moth. I didn't look it up because I, I didn't get a really close look at it, but it was a huge black moth. So sometimes these things are synchronicities, and we really want to hear from you. Okay? So, Let's for now... In. Goodbye from Shattered Reality.